Welcome to the Go Procast, where we invite business doers who are changing lives by sharing their stories, their strategies and tactics, and who bravely talk about their failures that actually led to their biggest successes. Now it's time to Go Pro with Jeremy Torres. My next guest is a certified mental performance consultant with a master's degree in applied sports psychology. He helps young people go from talented athletes to special ones by teaching them the mental skills and strategies that will allow them to make their minds work for them rather than against them. Please welcome to the Go Procast, Michael Huber. What's up? What's up? Hey, what's going on, man? Great intro. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Tried to uh, finally we got this worked out. We had a misfire a couple weeks ago, which happens. Is you know these calendars? Uh, I, I have two calendars myself, so I understand uh, something happened with our calendars, and we we had a miss. But uh, things are supposed to happen when they when they're supposed to happen, right? That's it. That's it. We're so here welcome, today. <laughs> welcome to the show, man. Uh, just so you know, what I do every show is I kind of pay homage to my friend, my business coach. Uh, one of the best sales coaches in the world, Steve Nudelberg, by asking you his trademark question, tell me something good. Tell me something good. Oh, wow. That's a tough question. I love it. Tell me something good. I mean, listen, I keep it simple, man. It's a good day. Sun shining. I'm grateful for what I have. Um, I'm really excited to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I'm looking forward to telling my story. I think that that's it's a great opportunity. It seems simple, but it's well, that's awesome. good. Let's let's start. Let's start from the start. Then, uh, basically, what you are, um, what you do for a living. We talk about that and how you help people. And the the high level part of it is the company is called the Freshman Foundation, and you help people. Is it mostly just athletes with sports psychology mindset issues? Correct. Yeah, my 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 target audience is young is young athletes, right? So high school to college is sort of the sweet spot. But I have clients from you know, nine, 10 years old, get started a little bit early, uh, a little bit earlier than I, I thought I might ever do, but it, it actually works out quite well. And I've also got uh, one older client who's uh, later in life, who's, you know, kind of well to do and wants to really get good at, you know, his, his golf and tennis game. And I work mm. with him. So it's sort of anything in between, but young people are, are my target, target audience. So since it's mental acuity or, or toughness or mindset, do you do most of your stuff virtually or do you have to be in person? So that's, that's a great question. I, I think when I got into the field, this is my second career. So when I got into the field, um, I started my training about five or six years ago in person was the name of the game, right? Mm -hmm. Great way, you know, really getting in person, kind of get to know people connect, did a lot of my training in person. Uh, and there's a lot of benefit to that. And then when I started my practice, COVID hit. So I had nothing, no, I had no choice, but to be virtual. And so the vast majority of my work is virtual and it works well. Um, but there's definitely something to be said for sitting in the same room with somebody and being able to read their body language and, you know, kind of connect with yep. them. So it's it's both. Yeah, and I think a lot more people are used to these days doing the virtual thing, especially when it comes to this kind of stuff. All my business coaching in the last two years uh, have been in person or sorry, per, one to one virtual coaching. You know, I used to do the seminar thing. I, I followed Tony around. Uh, hell, I went to Amsterdam to go to Business Mastery, too, with my wife, with him, with me and, you know, 3,000 of my closest friends, you know. Um, but but I think it's been more, more effective for me to have the one-to-one -one attention, even if it's for 30 minutes once a week, because I know that we're talking about me specifically and not where Tony feels like he's talking to you because he's got that gift, but really he's not. You got to be in state and he does a great job of getting you there. But when I pay somebody, you know, X dollars and I get him for 30 minutes or her, actually I have both uh, women and men coaching. I, I really, I just, I flourish but I have a complex of pleasing people. So I, I want to make them proud of me, you know, so that uh, they know my name, they, they follow me on LinkedIn and, and that helps. So do you find uh, there's a more of a personal connection? Uh, I know you were one-to-one, -one, but when you get them online, do you know, do, do you build that energy still? Yeah. I, for me, I am much more effective in a one-on-one -on -one setting as well. I'm more introverted by nature. Um, and so I really have, so we were talking before we recorded about kind of, you know, a set like personality assessments and things, right? So I recently did a, a Gallup strengths or Clifton strengths finder. And my number one uh, strength is relator. 
right? So I, I find that I'm really good at understanding people and where they're at and helping them. And so that's sort of my, my superpower, I, I think, mm. in terms of connecting with people. So I love the one-on-one. -on -one, and when I'm coached, I love one-on-one -on -one too. I feel uh, very skeptical when I'm in group coaching. Um, I learn things, but I also feel I get kind of lost. Yeah. And I don't want to do that to the people that I coach, whether for right or wrong. So let's go back then to the start and tell us about you know where you grew up and and that that experience. Did you have uh, you know did you like school and and how were you uh, how did you get into your career from school to career? Because really, I deal with a lot of kids with that trans transfer. And that you do too now. Uh, that's where I love giving all my time and energy is helping young kids who don't want to go to college necessarily or can't or not ready to, but have an entrepreneurial spirit spirit so i because I, i'm really talking to myself because that's how i was in school so how was that experience for you growing up sure i mean and i think we have a lot of similarities in that respect in terms of you know i always i was a sports junkie as a kid i played every sport you could imagine i watched sports nonstop. you know when i was what part real, of the world was it i grew up in long island okay. uh, so i'm from the east coast i live in new jersey now but i grew up in long island kind of Yankees fan, Giants fan, like just rabid sports all the way. And I always wanted to be an athlete, like a lot of kids, you know, professional athlete that didn't obviously work out. <laughs> and then I graduated from high school. I didn't go on to play sports in college. And there's a lot of reasons why I think that is, and we won't get into it, but I always wanted to be in sports, but you know, you sort of get that, oh, I've got to be responsible. I'm going to go to college and going to get a job and pay the bills. And that's the way I was raised. That was sort of, you know, I came from a blue collar family, like yeah, making yeah. money and paying the bills was a number one always. And all yeah. the other stuff, even though I love sports, like I didn't grow up in a house like my kids grow up in. Like my parents <laughs> didn't have money. We didn't travel. I didn't go to, right. We didn't, I didn't do all the stuff the kids do now. And I think I missed out on that. And I think I had a lot of regret that I never really followed my passion. And then when I got mm. to a place later in life in my thirties, late thirties, I started to question like, what am I doing here? Like I've done this for 15 years now and I'm not really happy, but I've made yeah. a good living and I've saved a few bucks. Like what if I take that savings and really make a life change for myself? And I had a lot of things I wanted to do. And so I did it. And, you yeah. know, now where I am working for myself with the challenges that come with being, it's you know, a solopreneur <laughs> by yourself doing it every day. Yeah, wearing all those hats. And uh, so kind of that we were on there where you help kids with mental acuity, mental toughness and focusing. Isn't it hard sometimes when you're pointing your finger at someone knowing there's three pointing back at you? How do you apply what you've learned and what you teach to yourself? It's like doctors make the worst patient. You know, uh, do you find it hard sometimes to get that self-discipline or what, what are some tricks that you do to get your, you know, your butt across the finish line? Um, I like to think I'm really good at connecting with young people in that respect. I try to be very open-minded and non-judgmental with them because I know, you know, I know as uh, from my personal experiences, but I also know as a, a, a sports psychology professional, people don't really respond well to demands, right? Yeah. Controlling yeah. sort of command and control motivational styles, right? It works for a bit, but it doesn't, it's not sustainable. Yeah. So I really want them to own what they're doing. And so what I try to do is make them feel comfortable. Like, Hey, I'm giving you this suggestion. And if you don't take it, that's okay. But just understand there's a consequence to it. Yeah. And what it ends up doing, and maybe, maybe you call it a mind trick, maybe you call it reverse psychology, but really what it is, is you're kind of making them take ownership of the process. Yeah. And I fight the urge to tell them what to do because a, I want to help them. And if they don't want to help themselves, well, like to you, I'm a people pleaser. But two, you're running a business, right? You want people to get results. And sometimes you think in the back of your mind, like, oh, I'm being too easy on this kid. Mm -hmm. And then mom and dad are going, what the hell's changing here? You know, he's still the same kid as he was two months ago. And I try to tell them, hey, this takes time. This doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. Overnight. You know? Yeah. Well, but the question was more about how do you apply those principles to yourself when you're having problems, you know, getting uh, getting on point or get behind do, do you use any of the tactics that you teach on yourself and what what are some tricks because you know as business owners you always have to be on point and we're human once you got the you've got that edge that training that we don't have that jedi well, mind stuff 100 percent, you know and, and i'm a big believer in you know practice what you preach right so whether it's meditating in the morning whether it's mm. jour journaling whether it's just having a set of core values and a mission to follow 
um, that, that when I wake up every day, I go, this is what my, this is what my objective is. Right. So one of the things I did this year, and maybe you're familiar with this, maybe you're not, but there's a book by John Gordon, um, called one word. And it's basically like picking one word that kind of guides your daily effort every day for a year. And so one of the things that was missing in my life, you know, I found was service. Yeah. Because I was so self-centered about what was going on with my business. How am I making enough money? What's going yep. on? Am I growing? And I'm like, I'm not really focusing on that service aspect. Now I do that with my clients, but I need to remind myself that every day I get up, what I do is about helping other people. It's not about me. And if I do that well, the rewards are going to come, right? So I'm constantly trying to check myself and I do try to practice the principles that I teach to the young people I work with. Yeah, that's great. And, and uh, my word this year, I so I have I haven't read the book, but I've been putting that pra- that principle into practice for two years now. Uh, this year, it's reinvent because I changed careers uh, after thirty years of being in the telco construction world. I retired. Uh, we sold the business, so I got to retire last year, and I took the second half of last year to build the studio and to, to focus on what I want to do and build all this, you know, tech and build all this you know, skill and, and mm-hmm. get to the platform up. And now this year it's reinvent It's stop thinking like I was a, a construction guy. Stop thinking as a worker, you know, but now it's all, it's really that service walking in service. And for me to, when I teach people things, I think I have to be the example, right? Because I've got a lot of mental depression in my family and a lot of really st- crazy stuff in my family tree so for me it's it's really heavy when i get off track Mm -hmm. so for me when i when that starts happening i can see it and i go "Uh uh-uh i gotta be the example i can't be a hypocrite so you know i drag my butt out of bed that's when you start talking about meditation and journaling and all that stuff it's got to be ingrained because it's hard to do sometimes so i love the stuff that you're saying yeah uh, go ahead well i was just gonna ask like the next thing is where do you get uh the caution because nowadays, and you do a good thing by asking them to give you feedback, but do you get some of that, the new millennial, and I, that's a bad word. I, I think millennials are awesome. I have a lawn care business with my son, and they're amazing workers. Yeah. But in your area, when you we have kids with a little bit of money, and because they can afford you, how are the, that, do you ever get that attitude of, you know, superiority right from the shoot that you got to work on? And how do you work that these days? Rarely, to be honest What's with good? you. I, I, I it's, it's rare that I get that. Um, what I do get a lot of is a lot of, um, perfectionism. Um, I, I think there's a lack of motivation, um, sometimes. So I think that's the biggest challenge I face, right? It's not, it's not superiority. It's not arrogance. There's none Good. of that. Kids are great. Like, but I think it's, a little bit of skepticism about it because it's not as tangible as a physical practice might be if you're an athlete. Yep. Um, and I think they've have so many competing interests in their lives that, you know, adding something else to the equation can be seen as a, as a, as a burden rather than a benefit. Right. And so my best clients are the ones that are like locked in all in, like committed to doing the work. Yeah. And I think in general, that tends to be, the older kids because they're just a little bit more developed cognitively and emotionally mm-hmm. 17 18 19 20 great 15 14 15 can be good but it's kind of hit or miss sometimes because you know they're just not seeing the connection between what we're doing and their performance yet yeah uh, so it takes a little bit of time but no nah, man the kids kids are great i mean parents i think you know they've been great too but they're a little bit harder to deal with most of the time <laughs> than the kids are <laughs> yeah well you you were a sports kid so you understand it if you used to see the coaches when the parents chirped a little too much they're like you know uh, i didn't gonna play here you know so at least you've seen that i was uh i was not a sports guy i was a musician so i was in the stands with the drum line but when my kids were really young i did football coaching for flag and stuff and when i heard mm-hmm. those parents church chirp i'd say i got the red shirt on i got the whistle on you want to come out here and volunteer your weekends be my guest but i see you every other weekend with your 23 year old trophy wife you can get <laughs> wait in the car yeah. or come out here every weekend with me and then you can have a voice yeah you know so uh but i, I your your level of, of those parents are much much greater i mean I, I was not a very competitive person about sports because i was a you know musician and uh i just <laughs> i never saw the um you know the, the i just didn't have a draw for it yeah. but you know, uh, that, uh, different uh, strokes. I was a musician too. I played the trumpet growing up 
And uh, I started when I was probably third grade and I played all, th all the way through high school. So yeah. I, I get that. I, I love music. I still love music and I love making music and playing music. And I think that, you know, it's important for the kids that I work with to have other, mm -hmm. ha have other things that they do, whether it's a hobby or some other, you know, competitive outlet or whatever it is. And, you know, I think that that's missing. I think what happens now is kids are just so intense about sports as our parents. It just, it generates this really, um, you know, unbearable pressure sometimes to perform and feel like you're getting the most out of the dollars and time that you're spending. And that's part of the reason why I'm in, I do what I do is to take some of that pressure out of the system or finding ways to cope with it so that it's not so unbearable. So with these kids, how do you define success? And I know it takes time, but uh, do you, do you have a, a baseline of performance since they're already well into their, their youth sports career? Uh, how do you work with measuring and, and defining that success for these kids? That's, that's a great question. And it's a hard question to answer. I think it's one of the biggest challenges we face in our field. I mean, certainly we have assessment tools. There's a variety of assessment tools that we use. Um, for me, you know, it's, it's really, it's really that first couple of, of sessions interviewing them at a really, you know, detailed level, trying to understand who they are and where they're coming from. Um, and the assess, you know, in terms of assessing production or, or performance or improvements is, 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 is really self-reported in a lot of ways, right? How do you feel? Do you feel yeah. better? Do you feel like you can cope in these situations? Do you feel like you're performing better? And, and listen, I think, you know, I, as, as, as a perfectionist, you know, recovering at some level, <laughs> you know, like I want my athletes all to be superstars because like, you know, what I do is really, I feel like it's really important, but that's just not the truth. The truth is you could be doing better and improving and still not see the performance results you want to see right now. Sure. And, and if you feel better about how you're able to deal with situations, deal with adversity, like, Hey, you know what? I was in this situation and I didn't blow up or I was in this situation. I didn't get down on myself. Like to me, that's progress because we're all going to fail. Sure. Right? Yeah. So if you, if you feel like you can handle those situations better than you are, right. You are handling those situations yeah. better because that's the only thing that matters is your perception of it. That's right. That's the beautiful thing about mindset is it's up to you to control it. And it's a choice. Yeah. And I'm still at 50 working against that, you know, <laughs> every day it's a battle. Yeah. Uh, it is. I say my weaknesses are strong. Actually, Pat Oswald said it, but I loved it. I stole it. Uh, so I was going to, I was going to ask you this question. I was going to wait till the end, but um, I keep, I don't want to forget it. And I need to know the answer. Why are the most headiest mind, you know, dependent athletes in the world seem to be extra point kickers? <laughs> Cause all that pressure comes on, I guess they're in the spotlight and it's a, you know, 58 yard and possibly long kick, or actually the, the probably the worst one is the, you know, 22 yard, you know, chip shot to win the Super Bowl. you know, but uh, it always seems like these kickers, you know, if they miss one in the game, they miss every single one in the game. Yep. It seems like the kickers, uh, the, the one person in all the sports who this mindset and, and physical or uh, mental training uh, affects the most out of every position. You've, you ever heard about that? And Oh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, listen, I think in general, what, what I find is that an individual athlete, whether it's, I mean, a kicker's playing on a team, but really they're, they're a team of one <laughs> in many ways, right? Yeah. But golfers um tennis well, players laces out except for laces out laces. <laughs> <laughs> it's finkelstein ray finkelstein's fault <laughs> pitchers even baseball hitters individual athletes tend to um go through that and a mm. kicker a kicker listen your one job is to kick the ball through the uprights <laughs> you have one right? job right you have one job and that's your identity making a field goal like everything's on the line when you kick that it's a referendum on your ability it's it's a certain level. It's a, it's a referendum, ref, referendum on you as a person. And if you miss, what does that say about you? What does that mean? You let everybody down. You let yourself down. I'm, I'm not good at this when that's not true. It's just yeah. one event. So one of the things we do with athletes like kickers is really get them to emphasize process, right? Process, oh, yeah. process, 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 right? Am I checking the boxes going through my routine, right? Because one kick in front of no people and one kick in front of a 70,000 people is really the same kick. Yes, yeah. The circumstances are just different, right? So how do we create a framework so that when you go out there, you're, you're blocking out that and you're yeah. emphasizing what you can control, that process of lining up in the right place, taking the same steps, hitting the ball the same way, and really narrowing down that focus so it's just the process and everything else going around you is, is just – 
it's it's tuned out or it's yeah it's white noise yeah. right versus so like a, oh no right yeah they even got a term for it right freeze the kicker right call that timeout right before he about he's about to kick yeah, absolutely give him more time to think about what he's about to do exactly get into his own head yep so um Gosh, I don't know why I'm all over the place with my questions, and I just had a great one. Oh, branding. Okay. Uh, I just have a little cheat sheet of questions over here because uh, that's what the show is about, right? Asking the right questions. Yep. But um, getting off of you know what you do, because this show is more about how we do it and how we build our business, and my audience is uh, a bunch of solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. So how do you build your business, and how do you brand this type of business? Because it is a very... You, you can't scale wide yet until you, you know, and that takes a long time in your industry to get a name and then you start putting people under you, I, I imagine. So how do you support the family and start with branding? How did you find success? Wow. It's something I work on. I mean, every single day, right? I've learned more about marketing in the last two, and I was in business, right? So I understood marketing yeah. at a high level. I worked for big consulting firms. I, I was in sales at, in various capacities. I, I get it. But marketing your own business is a totally different animal. And I think what I didn't understand was there's a very specific way to do that, right? Mm. The way I came into it was like, hey, I believe in myself. And I still, I, I still look at it this way. For me, the differentiator was me, right? Because there are, there are not that many people that do what I do, but there's a ton of coaches out there. Um, and they're all trained in a similar way, right? They all bring a value in terms of helping people be better, right? Yeah. Whether it's mental performance for athlete or whether it's an executive coach or life coach, whatever it is, right? They all bring value to the process. So what's the differentiator? It's not the quality of the interventions or the, the, the things that I teach you. It's me, yeah. right? So for me, the branding was about how do I let people know who I am? Right. And so that was my focus in the beginning. And a lot of the content and a lot of the work I do and all that is about me. But what I'm learning now is that it's not about me. It's about them. So now I'm starting oh, to I shift. love that. All right. Right. That, that, it's starting I got to give you my, 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 my trademark. The walls are, are melting. It sucks for podcast listeners, but for YouTube guys, it's pretty cool. <laughs> but that's yeah, hot. I love, I love it, man. Uh, <laughs> Bradley yeah. drops the bombs, you know, right. And I, as I saw that after I did that, I'm like, I got to get a sound effect. <laughs> yeah. And I've been really, I've been really into, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Donald Miller, but his books and his course about marketing and it's like basically about making your customer the hero in the story and you're, and you're the, you're the guide and I love it. Right. And so I've really worked hard at trying to come up with, a strategy of branding that like, Hey, listen, I'm here for you. Like yeah. everything I do is about you, but it's not about me, but here's how I'm going to help you get to where you want to go, which is what I want to do. Like, I'm not in this, like, listen, if I turn this business into something that's big and sexy and, you know, wildly profitable, great. Yeah. But, like that's not what I'm in it for. It can't I'm be in, the purpose, right? right. I, my purpose be the is benefit. to help you get to where you want to go. And if I happen to take that ride with you, awesome. If not, that's okay too. You know, like I can, there's, I could always go get another job. You know, I worked for 20 <laughs> years. I have two master's degrees. I'm not a dumb guy. Like, but I, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to help you do it and I want to do it my way. And uh, it's a lot of fun, man. I mean, you know what it's like. Hey, yeah. There's a lot of sleepless nights sometimes and a lot of, a lot of doubt. Like, what the hell am I doing here? Yeah. You know, you, you send out a hundred emails, you get nothing back. And you're like, Jesus Christmas, <laughs> like, what's going on here? But then you get that one email or that one phone call or one client says, man, I'm really happy you helped my kid. And it's like, now it's all worth it. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's why we do this stuff, you know, because you can't just do one thing because you, you got to get yeah. out to the, you got to get out to the message, but you got to talk to the person, you know, yes. like you said, it's about serving and it's about just putting out how I, I help people and how, what I've learned and who has helped me. Now we can share. Yes. You know, that's kind of what, how we walk around here. Definitely. And um, so, you know, Don Shula, he's one of my favorites. Uh, so keeping it in the sports, but my favorite quote is it's the stop that starts most people. And so when, when you're working with the kids, do they, do they have any sort of trepidation about all the work? Do they understand what's going on or, or are they more you know, easy to jump in the pool, you know, because they're, they're young and probably not as, you know, beat down as some of us old, old dogs are, you know? So do you find it's easy to get them to start thinking or do you have to show them some sort of proof? Uh, for this stuff or how, how do you kind of feel about what you see there? Um, yeah, I, I think it takes a little bit of effort to get them to buy in. Um, and to go back to what we were just talking about, I think the buy-in is in the connection. 
right? Yeah. Building the rapport with them. And this was a big part of my training, you know, building a rapport with somebody so that they can let their walls down and really open up. I think with young people, it takes a bit of time. They're not, they're, what I find, again, this is maybe just a hypothesis based on my own experiences and not anything that's particularly scientific, but young people have a hard time talking to adults because they're used to getting direction from them, telling them what to do. And then you get a guy like me, I'm 46 going on 47. I come in and I'm saying like, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think we should do? Or, you know, tell I want you to give me feedback, like what I could do better or, you know, and they don't sometimes don't know what to do with that because yeah. they're not used to somebody coming to them as an adult saying like, Hey, I value your opinion or I really need to understand. And so that's probably the hardest thing to, sometimes is to get them to open up and just be honest and like, give me honest feedback because if it's not working, don't lie to me. Don't tell me that, Oh yeah, this is great. And then, you know, then it's not really working for you. It's not helping anybody, but I think they're just reluctant to come out and be honest with me because they're afraid like, Oh, if I tell this guy that, you know, He's doing a shitty job, excuse my language, that, yeah. you know, he's going to get pissed at me. And like, that's just not it. It's not the way it works, but they're not, it's not common for them. They're not used to having adults treat them that way. So I was just kind of looking up here because um, one of my coaches gave me this homework assignment to listen to a podcast about exactly what you're talking about. And I know you know this because this is your corner of the world, but this, what you're saying totally reminds me of what this person called. Let me see if I can get to that point because this was really, it, it's really impactful. Uh, basically there's three kind of coaches. There's the, you know, the me coach where I was the flag football, put the, uh, you know, out there on the weekends working with the kids. And so that coach absolutely tells the kids what to do. Here's our next play. Here's what you're going to run. Bam, go do it. Then there's the high school coaches uh, and they're professional because they're being paid, but they're not being paid because they're great coaches. They're getting paid because they want to have summers off. Right. So they're working as coaches yeah. in, in schools and those coaches, um, they tell you what to do, but you know, they have, they have more knowledge base and they're telling you about your performance and they're really making you better because they know about mechanics mm -hmm. and they're right. telling you, you know, do these exercises. And then you have the elite coaches the, uh, the uh, professional side coaches like a, a Tom Brady's coach, right? He's the best athlete ever. He's got a coach, the Olympic gold medalist, who's the best at everything. He's got a coach. That person asks questions of the athlete, right? And so where I learned that from was this guy uh, who works with Pete Carroll. His name is Michael Gervais. Yep. And he did a, J a Dak Shepard podcast where they talked about this. This was a, such a great, I listened to this thing like, a few times and I took copious notes yeah. because it was so impactful to me because it, it applies to business coaching too. It applies to sure. working with your kids, giving them that, that invite. So what you're saying is really elite coaching stuff. So I got, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you're working with these kids in a way that elite coaches work. That tells me a lot about your business model, about your mindset. You're comfortable with uh, uh, not showing a false bravado. I'm going to, I know everything. It's about what it making you feel what you know. Uh, so yeah, accountability. I, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that there's a lot in that, right? Michael Gervais is like, he's a leader in our field, right? In sports psychology, that's his training. That's what he does. He's gone on to like really, really big things. He has his own podcast and a lot of people rely on him, but he's right. Like it's about really giving the athlete the room to figure out things for themselves. And I think, what we don't understand about young high, by high school kids, say, for instance, they've been playing their sport 10, 12 years. They're experts. They understand what they need to do physically. They don't yeah. need you to tell them what to do. They know how to do it already. Their body knows how to do it and what to do. And they know how to solve their own problems and they're their own worst critic. So what you need to do is really give them something to think about so that they can solve their own problem. Yeah. Right? Those are muscles they haven't worked out yet. Exactly. Especially for younger athletes, the ones that go to college, say, for instance, which is why I'm so interested in this is you're going from being a big fish in a small pond at high school to being, I've heard someone say on my, I had someone on my podcast who said like a medium sized fish in a big pond, right? An average sized fish. Yeah. You're just like everybody else and you yeah. don't know what to do with it. Failure becomes more <laughs> common. And how do you deal with that? Well, yeah. People can help you with that, but you need to figure it out. So are we giving them the tools to do that? And I think most people's gut instinct, my, myself included, is to give them the answer, right? One of the things I learned in grad school was don't be afraid of silence. 
right? Mm, Sit there yeah. for 30 seconds or a minute and don't say anything. Let them answer the question. I'm still pretty bad at that. Like I, I, <laughs> I want to put the, I want to put the answer into their mouth and it's like, no, let yeah. them figure it out and be uncomfortable. Even if they don't know the answer now, they're going to take it and it's going to start a process of trying to discover. Yeah. Especially, that's really hard in sales too. When you're asking for the clothes <laughs> or something, just once you ask, you push that pen across the desk, just to not say anything is really one of the mm, toughest things. I'm getting better at that too, in terms of running my business, like knowing that, Hey, like they've got to make this decision and buy in. Here's the information. Here's what I'll do. But to sit back and just know that maybe there's a no coming at you. You just got to be okay with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause the right people are going to be there. Right. You know, so uh, I appreciate uh, your time here with me and, and uh, all this stuff that we're talking about with sports and psychology, it all translates to business. So my audience, they're going to really learn a lot from this, I, I believe. How can we uh, find you? How can we support you? What, 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 what do you got going on? I got a lot going on, so I'll try to keep it brief. I, I would say that if you want to learn more about the best way to learn about my business is at my website, Michael. V is in vincenthuber.com. Uh, I also have the Freshman Foundation website as well, which is up there, freshmanfoundation.com. And you can find me on social media at Michael V. Huber, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all those places. My social media presence is much bigger than I ever <laughs> imagined it would, it would it be. Is now. My, pro my proficiency is growing <laughs> yeah, that, in the, terms of understanding how to use it. The branding, I, I have... Um... Uh, I'm a uh, student of and an affiliate of uh, the Noodlebergs uh, LinkedIn like a pro. And that is in business, the number one way to do organic build, brand building by building yourself. And uh, if you want to see some of that stuff, I could turn you on to his stuff. It's amazing. I would love it. I would uh, so, love it. and then you're offering a 30 minute free strategy session to the listeners. To when, everybody. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So they just reach out to you because I can see a Calendly, Calendly event, which I could put in the notes here. But if they reach out to you through LinkedIn or through the website or through your email, uh, absolutely, that's the what, best way. The easiest way, right? If you want to contact me through the website, through LinkedIn, you see the link, sign up. First session, just kind of understand, like, is this for you? Is it for your kid? Yeah. Um, happy to talk to you. I love to make connections. I love to talk to people. I found that about myself. Like, having these, and, and I have my own podcast as well. Check out yeah. the freshman foundation podcast, but like being a podcaster, and I'm sure you see this as well, that one-on-one -on -one connection, like to really have a deep conversation with somebody, even though it's on, on being recorded is amazing. I love to talk to people and like pick their brains and ask questions, which clearly you do as well. So we have that, that I in do. common. It's amazing to, to sit and talk to somebody at a deep level and not just, you know, make small talk. Yeah, if I don't get a, a, a wow or that was a good, that's a good question, I feel like a total failure. It's a, <laughs> it's, I don't even want to air it. I watched Sean Evans on the Hot Ones, the Chicken Wing uh, Hot Sauce. He's He's got the best interview questions ever. And every you know, he's got hundreds of interviews. And everyone was like, wow, that's a great question. Where'd you get that? Where'd you find it? I strive to be like Sean Evans. That's my yeah. goal. As an interview, yeah. as a well, podcast. you got a couple. You got a couple. You got the first question you asked right off the bat. I was like, "Wow, that's a good question." <laughs> like, oh, crap, how do I answer it? That's all, Stevie, for you, man. I appreciate you, Mike. Uh, we've been working on getting together. It was totally worth the wait, and I, I look forward to, to following you on LinkedIn, following your progress, and uh, getting you some business, hopefully, from the, from this exposure. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. It was great to talk to you. And the same. All right, we'll talk soon. All right, thanks everybody for join, joining us today in the GoProcast. We appreciate you, and we will see you on the next episode. <laughs>